Good morning. My name is Jermaine Freeman, and I uh, serve as senior advisor to uh, Mayor Tim Kelly of the city of Chattanooga, and I'd like to introduce my colleagues, uh, Brittany Pione and Donna McConico, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi. As, uh, as Jermaine said, I'm Donna McConico. I'm the CEO of Signal Centers, which is a large nonprofit organization in Chattanooga. We serve TANF recipients and TANF families locally in Chattanooga through two of our programs. One is an early childhood education program, and the other is a program called Family Forward, where we work with uh, moms who are pregnant or have a child under the age of three. I have given you uh, the tool we use to, to measure sustainability and, and self-sufficiency, and also some of our outcomes from that Family Forward program, which is a partnership with the city. I have to tell you, I've worked with low-income families for over 30 years. And it has been a delightful thing to be able to help families navigate many of the obstacles that overcome independence. Our programs have 85% of our participants uh, qualify for free or reduced lunch. But this opportunity to build intensive case management aligned with private sector employers and post-secondary education, as well as the city of Chattanooga, I think has the, op has the potential and will bring families out of the cycle of poverty. Oftentimes, social services operate in silos. Well, they work together, but they don't cross over to that employment thing. And there's one thing we know is that the only sure way out of poverty is employment. So that's our focus of this grant. And I really believe it's going to be a game changer for many families in Chattanooga and our region. And frankly, I just want to be a part of this. I want to be part of something new and helping families achieve that independence. Thanks. Good morning, guys. My name is Brittany Payone, and I am the VP of HR at Steam Logistics in downtown Chattanooga. So to give you some background, we are a third-party logistics provider. And last year, we hired 500 employees, and we've made a commitment to the city to hire 400 more in the next five years. So we have spoken with the city on workforce development, and we've partnered with local colleges on a certification that would take participants through a 10-week process on learning logistics. We see a lot of value in, in an individual starting the program, completing it, and having a level of background in what we do every day, and also being prepared to interview. We are interested in hiring talented people that are ready to contribute, and we feel that this program is going to be presented today will uh, have the opportunity to add to it. Thank you. So I'm an economic developer by trade. I do economic development work for the city of Chattanooga. And in the office of Mayor Kelly, where, where we started this planning grant last fall, um, I did not think of myself as a social service provider. Um, as an economic developer, I know full well how important the, the, the battle for talent is in terms of a city's prospects for economic development and attracting new and thriving businesses to a city. Uh, and I know how important talent is when you talk to employers about creating jobs that pay livable wages. But in doing this work and in starting this work last fall, what I had to learn was that my city, Chattanooga, along with many of your cities, will never reach its full potential until all of our residents uh, have an opportunity to fully participate in our local economy. Talent can be developed and skills can be taught. And until our communities can commit to investing in all of our residents, including our most low-income families, we will continue to suffer a deficit in talent. The war for talent is the final frontier for economic development. The power of this Tennessee Opportunity Pilot is that it grants local communities the ability to say with clarity that there is a way to break intergenerational cycles of poverty. The reason that we decided to collaborate with Donna, who works with Signal Centers, and with Brittany, who works for STEAM Logistics, is because we believe that social service support and targeted workforce development uh, around industries are two sides of the same coin. Family-focused support and industry-driven employment training uh, must be paired together. As a member of Mayor Kelly's staff of the city of Chattanooga, we designed our One Chattanooga Pathways to Opportunity proposal to encompass both social service support and industry-driven employment uh, for the target population. This, the power of this grant opportunity is that it offers a supercharged approach because of the help from the state to catapult our local efforts far ahead of where we'd be without the state's assistance. With the state's help, we intend to take 
over 1,000 low-income individuals and their families out of poverty over the next three years by combining family-focused support with workforce training in high-growth industries. The Chattanooga market boasts a significant number of competitive advantages that make it attractive to employers and workers alike. At the beginning of 2020, prior to the pandemic, Forbes magazine declared that Chattanooga would be the number one city for new jobs in the entire country. For those of you from other cities, don't be jealous and don't hate. But that's just, that's just how it is. <laughs> Bringing greater clarity, consistency, and coherence to our local workforce development functions will allow us to place more Chattanoogans on suitable and sustainable career trajectories. The Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Opportunity Act of 2021 creates a pathway to do exactly that. Specifically, the Opportunity Pilot Initiative proposed by the City of Chattanooga and its partners unites a multitude of nonprofit, private sector, and public sector agencies around a common goal that leverages unprecedented and timely investment from the state of Tennessee. Even now, two years into the pandemic, Chattanooga has over 11,000 unfilled jobs. Yet we have so many people living in low-income circumstances. Our workforce development and social service efforts have been siloed when, in fact, they should be working together to promote family and financial stability. So we intend to do something about that by focusing on five key sectors uh, that, that can create industry-driven pathways. Information technology, advanced manufacturing, early childhood education and child care, health care with a focus on nursing, and logistics, which is why Brittany has joined us today. Importantly, this initiative is focused not only on boosting job readiness and placement, it has been conceptualized through a lens of equity and access that when operationalized can close long-standing opportunity gaps between white Chattanoogans and households of color. According to the Urban League of Greater Chattanooga, at the end of 2019, the median family income of a white family in Chattanooga was twice the median family income for black families, and blacks in the metro area were nearly three times more likely to live below the poverty line. The persistent racial wealth gap stifles our, our larger economy. By some estimates, closing these gaps nationwide could add another 4 to 6 percent to the U.S. GDP and tens of millions of dollars to Chattanooga's local economy. Addressing these gaps is a core element of uh, Mayor Tim Kelly's One Chattanooga Strategic Plan and our TANF Opportunity Pilot Initiative will make meaningful progress towards this goal. This matters for both moral and economic reasons. No one in a city with as much opportunity as we have should have to live in poverty, particularly when so many jobs need to be filled. We believe that our plan can be sustained locally and scaled across the state efficiently. Chattanooga is eager to lead the way and to do our part. We intend to assist 1,100 adults complete employment training and be hired into family-sustaining careers that pay a living wage. Right now, a low-income single mom may have to quit her current job and forego income in order to participate in the training she needs to get a higher job. If she decides to pursue this training, there may be many barriers to her success. She might have to travel for over 45 minutes on public transportation to drop her children off at a child care program uh, that, that accepts child care certificates and then another hour to reach her employment training program. But we all know that's not a sustainable solution. With few early childhood education providers open past 5.30 p.m., it'll be a stretch to complete her coursework and return to collect her children before it closes and then home again. If her children are in school, she will have to coordinate work with the school bus schedule so that children of all ages are adequately supervised and young children are not left home alone. She may also struggle without the support of her children's second parent. As of 2020, there were 20,296 open child support cases in Hamilton County and 1,149 warrants for arrest due to failure to pay child support. And her children may be struggling with health issues that require appointments during training hours. If these systems, child care, transportation, and workforce development, as well as child support and family reunification, were working together to support this mother's success, and if she had access to case management focused on her family success using a two-gen approach, she would have a much better shot at completing training and lifting herself and her family out of poverty. Several critical factors will distinguish this initiative from previous efforts. Our approach will be innovative but, pragma but pragmatic. If our proposal is selected, our innovation is that we will provide stipends to participants who are enrolled in industry-driven employment training, as well as subsidized tuition as the participant earns a stackable credential that can be applied as college credit should the participant enroll in college, where they could then use Pell Grants and Tennessee Reconnect to help pay the remaining t education costs. We will be collaborative but accountable. The City of Chattanooga will serve as the backbone organization. We intend to see continuous improvement uh, and a non-siloed approach coordinating case management through a software platform 
uh, that uh, allows case management professionals can share and by regularly convening social service partners with the help of our local nonprofit, United Way. Successful, successful collaboration is about achieving shared goals for shared benefit as long as everyone understands their role. Signal Centers will oversee a coordinated entry program for case management and family-focused support that addresses barriers that will inevitably be encountered, such as child care assistance, public transportation assistance, digital inclusion, and family reunification. Our workforce programs will be worker-centered but industry-aligned. Through partnerships with employers like Steam Logistics, participants will finish their industry-driven training and transition into careers that pay a living wage. Workers need support and resources to follow them on their individual workforce journeys. Economic mobility will be possible. The color of your skin, your gender, or the neighborhood you grew up in will no longer be uh, the determining factor of how you fare in life. Industry-driven employment training will be offered at community centers throughout the city, and we will hire workforce navigators from neighborhoods where adult participants may reside. Our premise is that stability comes with education, job training, and a living wage. By having both a workforce and a social service support focus, our proposal will impact the purposes and the outcomes of the TANF program and the Tennessee Department of Health. By connecting adults to industry-driven employment training and careers afterward, we will see an increase in the number of families that achieve economic status and stability, more parents will be empowered as their children's first teachers, and we will see decreasing psychological distress, and we will see an increase in family engagement. Our team includes our partners at Signal Centers and United Way, along with partners at Chattanooga State Community College, the Tennessee College of Applied Technology, and the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. We are also using the University of Tennessee's Social Work Office of Research and Public Service, and additional partners include our public transit partner, CARTA, uh, the City of Chattanooga's Office of Family Empowerment, the City of Chattanooga's Department of Early Learning, our digital inclusion partner, the Enterprise Center, and First Things First, which special, specializes in family reunification services, and our partner in industry research and employer relationships, the Chattanooga Area Chamber of Commerce, which has helped us to build the relationship with STEAM Logistics. At the conclusion of our three-year pilot, 1,100 individuals will have completed employment training and be hired into family-sustaining permanent jobs. 1,100 families will benefit from intensive, two-generation case management and family reunification services to support long-term support and long-term success and stability. The workforce development and social service programs will be knit together so that more low-income Chattanoogans can benefit from new structures created during this pilot and we can positively impact Chattanooga's overall economy. Local companies will know there are talented parents eager to take advantage of workforce and grow their careers and support their children. We will complete an independent, randomized control trial evaluation that establishes Chattanooga's approach as replicable, successful model that ensures that poverty and government dependence are brief periods because families can access proven case management, employment training, good jobs, family support. We will create momentum for Chattanooga to sustain this approach beyond the grant period and share best practices with other cities eager to support low-income families in their rise out of poverty. The vast majority of our budget is passed on directly to program participants, about $16,000 in investment per participant, including stipends and subsidized tuition. Our investment is a direct investment into the participants of the pilot. We believe that if we properly invest in these parents by encouraging them to pursue educational and professional outcomes, we can break the cycle of intergenerational poverty and, and move people off of their dependence on government benefits. Nothing in this scale has ever happened in Chattanooga before, and we can change people's lives along the way. Industry-driven workforce development, and we've made sure that every training has a job at the end of the program in the five key areas that we've identified. A practice of regularly sharing data and referrals and evaluating systems gaps will be important. During this pilot, we'll build a technology platform that can be shared by participating partner agencies. We will prioritize poverty-ending training programs. We will conduct a randomized control trial to evaluate our approach. If we show success, we will create momentum and support for expanding this initiative beyond this pilot. So our theory of change is that we talked with participants in a, in a small pilot program that we did in Chattanooga called our Google IT Impact Program. And I want to leave you with this quote from one of the participants who went through the program. I have lived in low-income housing my entire life. I did not realize how big the world is and did not have a big mindset to imagine myself in another world. We have failed if we do not create possibilities and opportunities for all of our residents. This work isn't just about helping people get jobs or social service support. It's about helping people see their potential in a world full of possibilities. But they'll never understand this unless we can tear down the barriers which keep people from living the lives they want. 
That is our mission, that is our focus, and that is what we will do. Thank you. Uh, Jermaine, thanks for that presentation. Um, <clears throat> and my, my question is, other than the scale of what's proposed here, give me a sense of what from you, your perspective is fundamentally different in the approach than the current order. So in Chattanooga, what we've been doing is we've had different sorts of siloed workforce programs in the past that either, that sort of left out certain elements of, of, of the components that people really needed that were low income to succeed. And so we've tried workforce developments that didn't, workforce development programs that didn't pay a stipend. We've tried workforce development programs that didn't offer a stackable credential. We've, um, we've offered workforce development programs that didn't provide social service support. On the other side, we provided social service support that didn't have great workforce programs and social service support that didn't have workforce programs that moved people into a living wage job. So as we thought about this, pro this project and thought about, well, what is the solution that makes sense for people in Chattanooga who are low income? The answer for us is to combine all of those elements into one clear, concise, uh, coordinated entry program in which all of these things are wrapped into one. Social service providers like Donna, who don't specialize in workforce development, shouldn't be asked to do workforce development. And workforce developers and economic developers like me shouldn't be asked to do social service support. So let's create a system, a coordinated entry system that is pragmatic, but that brings us together. And let's understand that economic and workforce development as we move forward will require social service support if we are serious about uplifting low income families out of poverty. Jeff McCord, Labor and Workforce. So um, you've got me excited. This is how I look when I'm excited, by the way. <laughs> Same way I look when I'm bored, so you never can tell. Um, it is powerful to have Brittany here. Powerful, powerful to have a private sector employer here. Um, so what you're describing in Chattanooga, the strategy there is exactly what we're trying, what we have as a state strategy. So help beg, I beg your pardon here for a minute, but pre-pandemic 3.2 million people were employed in the state of Tennessee. As of today, 3.2 million people are employed in the state of Tennessee. We don't have enough people. We have the same amount that were employed. And so there's a huge opportunity to build pipelines to non-traditional areas that we, we don't have right now. And that's exactly what you've described um, with somebody standing up there who's your private sector employer with an economic developer doing the pitch. So way to go, way to think differently. Um, I can, I can, um, I just applaud that your innovation and your thinking um, all the way around. Hey, good morning. Emily House from the Higher Ed Commission. I had a question about the randomized controlled trial, so I'm going to put my researcher hat on for a second. And I noticed it when you had it up on the slide and then you spoke to it a moment ago, but is your intent to randomize access to services and then evaluate thereafter? I think yes. it was the slide after this that no. mentions the RCT. Maybe not. Oh, sorry. There we go, at the, at the bottom. So it mentions the collaboration with UT. So my initial question was going to be, was, is, is research existing on this that is the basis for what you're hoping to intervene on? But then your comment toward the end led to my actual question, which is, is it the intent to randomize access to services for the purpose of evaluation? It is our intent to randomize access to services. Um, we have a small pilot uh, that, I, like I mentioned during the presentation, that we're working on now that we developed actually as a result of funding that was provided by the Tennessee Department of Human Services to do a targeted workforce program that trained uh, low-income families in Google IT certifications. Uh, and those, those folks uh, have been going through that program. We paid them a stipend, and now they're 
we're doing job placement to get them into IT jobs. Uh, so we fully intend uh, to sort of, we would like to scale that up because that's, that's the first time that we've ever done anything like that. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to use the state's help to sort of supercharge what we were doing um, and uh, to really sort of create a new model that's never been done before. I want to follow up on that. Um, I think I understood your question. Um, are you really going to randomize? Are you going to really pick out of a hat <laughs> the people who get to participate in the program? Because that's what it means to randomize the uh, participants. And y y there's a lot of research that shows that the reason why people people self-select into these kind of programs and they're more motivated than people or have different circumstances. So if you're really going to allow everybody in uh, that wants to be in, then you're not really randomizing uh, selection of people who who participate. So just want to make sure that we under, we're talking from the same. It, it, am I correct on this? Yeah, so my question That's what I was thinking. Right, and so, so I think the answer to that is, is that we, we wanna make sure um, that as we build out the randomized control period that we, so first of all, I sort of think that it's, it, is, it is going to be very difficult to recruit all of the people that we want to recruit. Um, in, our, in my workforce development experience, even if you offer a great program like this, like you've gotta work to go find the people to get them to fill the pipeline. Um, and so I, as, as, we, as we think about that, I don't anticipate, I, I truly believe that one of our biggest challenges is, and I'm, I'll just be very honest about this, is going out and actually finding and recruiting enough people to, to, to fill the pipeline. And I think that, that that's gonna be a real, a real challenge for us. Um, however, we're gonna do everything that we can to, to, to do it, and we're gonna create a, a vast social media campaign uh, to sort of help us along the way to get there. And so there will be a, a control, control group. Go ahead. And, uh, and I'll speak a little bit to this. I'm on UT's Social Works uh, Board of Visitors and uh, have worked with UT Schwartz quite frequently. And they are going to be our advisors on this, on how to do it. And there may be, there, I, I don't know that it will be exactly a randomized control group, but there will be a control group uh, from people who are, who are on TANF who are being served. But UT is designing that piece for us. So we will make, because we want, we know that research matters. We know that it's important to be able to demonstrate that this program made a difference. And UT uh, School, Social Work Office of Research and Public Service is really skilled at that. Doug Coatsworth is the new, uh, Dr. Coatsworth is the new uh, director of that uh, initiative. And I think he has some great ideas about that. One more follow-up question, completely unrelated. Um, we've been doing case management for a long time. <laughs> Uh, and case management is fundamental to to your program. What's the difference in the co in the case management you're going to be doing now and the case management that's been done for decades? And we've been doing case management for have. decades. So yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that's kind of my, my jam here. You know, I love case management. And you know, I gave you some data on our Family Forward program. It has been so successful. And UT Schwartz does an external evaluation of that program. They've been able to demonstrate a return on investment of four dollars for every dollar put in. But we have not focused on employment. We have focused on family stability. So as we recruit case managers for this program, my intent is to train them to understand that the only way really out of poverty is through employment. And so there will be a focus. There will be train the trainers. We will have weekly meetings to talk about how people are, are progressing. And we are also going to embed those case managers with other organizations. Signal Center is not going to do all that. So I've already uh, talked with La Paz, who serves the Latino community in our, in our city. We've talked with others. Uh, first Things First, of course, is going to be a partner as well. We are looking at how do we go to where people are, and that's how we feel like most of the recruitment will take place. So does that answer your question? 
Okay. So um, j just to share a, a piece of information, the discussion that we've had around evaluation is the very reason that we are engaging an evaluator for, the, uh, for all seven pilots. What we want to help folks do is to design and then execute the evaluation that validates what it is that we're doing. So you're not gonna be on your own in doing that. One of the, <clears throat> to, to, to me, one of the things that we were trying to solve in this whole approach was <clears throat> doing some things, or, or, or and I, would, I would say, have, taking a hub and spoke approach where there are some aspects of what you do that all seven are gonna do. And so why should we force all seven to independently make those expenditures. So, so, so we, 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 we are in the final stages of bringing on an evaluator that's gonna help us with all, with, with all these issues. That is music to my ears. I, I just have to say, uh, Signal Centers, we have an external evaluator, UT Schwartz and the Ox Center for Metropolitan Studies in Chattanooga that evaluate every program we do. And they have true outcome measures, not just outputs, not just we serve so many. Uh, but have actual outcomes of how did this make a difference and what is the impact of this work on their lives. So, uh, so, and I think we're a little bit unique in that. Most social service agencies don't have the funds or the intent. They're, they're about the good work, but not necessarily about measuring the, the actual, um, I guess, impact of the work. So I, I love that you're going to do that. You're absolutely right. That wouldn't make sense for us all to do something different. Thanks again so much. I'm David Hawk. I serve the legislature East Tennessee. So I want to hear a little more since we have some time. Tell me about the private sector participation in this uh, in this program. Tell me what, in, if you're a representative broadly of the private sector, what's going on now and, and how are we seeing some innovation with the private sector coming into this plan? Well, I would say for us, um, just, oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, partnering just with local colleges on creating a credential for participants to go through. So we are working with Chattanooga State UTC about putting together a logistics program. Um, I think that's just innovative in itself for having an employer get involved with it from the get-go. So we're excited about that, seeing if, uh, if we can have some good measurements from that program. and. Uh, have great candidates to join Steam Logistics after they've completed it. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Fournette. Uh, six months of case management, so I'm asking a follow-up question, um, or an aftercare question, I guess. Is there a mechanism for people to check back if something happens in 12 months and I have a really sick kid, or I have a broken leg and I miss work for whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I am standing up, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, in our case management model, the intensive case management, first of all, it's home base. We're not making appointments for people to show up to us. So we're going to where they are in their most comfortable surroundings. But we will also follow them. It's not like there will be a period of intensive case management, then case management will continue because we all know that when the crisis hits is when people lose their jobs. And then that cycle starts again and people are not able to find the next job because they had to leave the last job and they've been in crisis. So our intent is we will, we have a step down process. It's a weekly face-to-face -face visit for the first six months and then, or as long as they need it. It may just be two weeks. You know, people may just need help with one issue in their life. It may just be that they need transportation. And then we will move to an every other week, then a monthly, then a quarterly. And we, we do work with employers um, on the back end to say these are the needs and let us, let us help. If, if you have a problem with this participant who's in our program, call us. We'll help intervene. If they're having trouble getting to work, maybe their child care uh, system is broken if, uh, or their transportation. So we will do that and, you know, until they're fully launched. And we also will use one case manager with them. We're not going to switch them when they move to a lesser intense thing. So they have that relationship. I, I like the employee communication portion because as an employer, we don't always know 
what's necessary and what's going on on the back end and that what and a lot of employers will step in and help if they have that awareness thank you have to hire any more oh yeah <laughs> We actually did a, I'm not trying to anticipate anything, but we always want to be ready. So we actually did a job fair at UT School of Social Work two weeks ago. Uh, we have another program that we're working with with the Housing Authority where we're going to need some social workers, some case managers to do, to do that. So, How'd the job fair go? It went really well. I mean, this new social workers, you know, I kind of like to get them new, I, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, Sometimes when people have been out a while and have sat in an office and everybody's come to them, they aren't quite as ready to get in their car and drive out to the, to the community. So we found that young social workers do real well. And we also have between seven and ten interns doing 3,000 hours of, of, uh, of internships with us every year as well. We should mention that Brittany is a recovering social worker. Now <laughs> <laughs> it's a red light. I, Thank you. Thank you all so much.